good afternoon, my name is Andrzej Niedzielski, I'm from uh, Nikolaus Kopernikus University in Stockholm, Poland. And uh, for the next 10 15 minutes, I'll be talking about low mass companions for bright giants. First of all, I should mention that this is essentially a teamwork based on collaboration with Ale Polszczak from uh, Penn State. And of course, most of the work is done by the PhD students, uh, in this case from Toru, Jerusalem, Monika Adamov, Radeka, Iwelina Durecka, and Kacper Kowalik. Uh, what low mass companions to bright giants has to do with planetary nebula? That's maybe a question that you're asking yourself. I think the answer is pretty obvious. One of mechanisms to, of mechanism to produce asymmetric planetary nebula is uh, uh, binary evolution. So uh, if you have uh, uh, at some point a trace of common envelope, you may have the companion, your star, is bound a little bit of the envelope or produce a disk that at the end will result in a asymmetric planetary nebula. It's therefore reasonable to look at the binary or low mass companion frequency around evolved stars and that's, that's what I'm going to, to show you. Uh, I will essentially show you results for our own uh, planet search, uh, planet but also low mass companions that we uh, performed with uh, those guys. But at some points I will also uh, present you results from other studies to give you a wider uh, perspective on what we are doing. Ah. Okay, a little bit of history at the beginning. So, as you probably know, the first uh, planet around some other star, and, uh, not around the sun, but some, uh, about around another star, was discovered in 1992 by Alex Wolstrom and uh, Frey. Uh, very unexpectedly, about the neutron star. That's a tiny planetary system uh, of three planets, uh, actually Earth-sized planets, hopelessly inhabitable and very, very strange. Uh, only three years later, the planet was discovered around a star which was much more like our sun, our sun 51 Berg. That was done by Mayor and Kellogg. Using already the technique that is most frequently used in planetary searches, which is the radial velocity measurement, precise radial velocity, radial velocity measurement. Uh, ten years after the discovery of the first planet around the star, uh, the first gas giant was discovered around the star. That's Iota Draconis B. So the field I'm talking about here is pretty young. That's only 12 years that people dig for planets around the whole stars. So many new things uh, are here, and not everything is very well settled down yet. Okay, about the time, about 2002-2004, we decided to call it Orchard to launch our own radial velocity search for, for planets around stars uh, that will be uh, a little bit different than all other radial velocity searches. Uh, we wanted to look for planets around uh, evolved stars, go a little bit against the current and uh, uh, we started actually such a search with the motivation first of all to search for planets around intermediate mass stars which is uh, uh, actually uh, the most important part I think of this search because if you use the radial velocity technique you are limited to stars that collaborate with you you need stars that have uh, many narrow uh, spectral lines if you have star that is rotating too fast or it's too hot, it, it has white lines and it has few lines, it will not collaborate with you, you will not reach the precision you need to find planets. So, to look for planets around stars more massive than, say, 1.2, 1.5 solar masses, you have to find either another technique or to wait for the stars to evolve a little bit and uh, cool down so you can observe them as subgiants or giants and then you can reach the more massive stars. That's, that's <coughs> Then, of course, as we reach, as we, uh, as we go into the population of sub giants and giants, the other goal was, of course, to look for planets around evolved stars to, hear, to see how the planetary systems uh, evolve and to search for traces of many stellar planetary interactions. Of course, as a regular velocity survey uh, requires a lot of high quality data, we have an extra 
science based here, which is lots of stellar astrophysics for free, a couple of PhD thesis just for free using the data that we have at hand. So, okay, in 2004, we launched the survey. It was pretty obvious from the beginning that we'll use the survey telescope. I'm going to meet the hobby analyst telescope in Texas with a high resolution spectrograph, delivering a beautiful spectral resolution of 60,000. The spectrograph is also equipped with a gas cell, iodine cell actually, which allows for precise radial velocity measurements. Precision that we reach is about 5 meters per second, which is perfectly enough for our purpose. Of course, the strategy, the strategy is uh, based on the abilities of the Orbiter the telescope, but also on what we, are look, what we are looking for, which are essentially uh, long period uh, orbits. So uh, the sampling and the cadence is optimized for this kind of objects. Um, what makes our survey different from all other radial velocity surveys, or from most of the other radial velocity surveys, is the sample that we use. It is, of course, uh, optimized for hobby LED telescopes in Northern Hemisphere and so on and so on. Most stars are pretty faint, but the main difference is the choice of, of stars that we observe. In a typical radial velocity survey, you have lots of giants, of, course, of dwarfs, of course, starting from late F spectral type down to M, and few giants and giants just uh, as a reference star. In our survey, the choice of targets is completely different. What we have is a set of over 1,000 stars, mostly giants, subgiants, and only 200 reference dwarfs. Uh, actually, we have three different samples here. The reference sample of, of uh, dwarfs, then the sample of subgiants and giants, that's the one in gray, and then we have a sample that we call Cloud giants, but there are cloud giants, giants, and bright giants here. We actually started with about 1,500 stars, but no, not all of them were uh, observed with HD. So now we uh, uh, continue with a set of 1,360 stars for our at least two epochs of radial velocity star. Every uh, Of course, the first stage in our analysis is the determination of uh, stellar parameters. So in the two samples that are most important for us here, in the clump giants and sub giants, uh, we have a uh, slightly different range of log Gs, which are important for us, and in the end, uh, in luminosities and masses. So of course, from the point of view of uh, um, low mass companions to the bright giants, most important will be the clump giants uh, sample with about 350 stars uh, reaching up to uh, log L nearly 3 and with uh, log G below 2 quite frequently. Uh, such a set of uh, stars is unfortunately connected with a number of problems that we have to deal with uh, looking for low mass combined. First of all, it is well known that the K giants are all radial velocity variable. That's uh, knowledge that dates to the uh, 80s actually. And we have to deal with uh, both long period and short period variations uh, in our analysis of radial velocities. Short periods were, uh, short period variations were uh, identified by Axis in Cochrane in 1992 as a result of P mode oscillations. And we more or less know how to deal with them because we can use the uh, scaling relation for Kielsen and Betty. But the long period variations are a little bit more difficult to explain because they can uh, come from non radial pulsations, uh, rotation induced activity like spots, and uh, in the end they may be also due to low mass combined. So we have to consider all those effects before launching the low mass combined hypothesis. Of course, there is also another problem connected with those stars, which is evolutionary track overlap. In this part of the Hairston Russell diagram, it's not easy to determine mass and age from the spectroscopic data that we have, so uh, our stellar parameters are somewhat uncertain, and that's something we have to deal with. Okay, so that's how the uh, helpful Brussels diagram for our stars look like. We have uh, uh, here the uh, oscillations in the very big scale here in the color. So for dwarfs, we have very little oscillations, but we have to deal with multiple giants, bright giants, we have to deal with 
hundred or few hundred meters per second radial velocity oscillations we have to deal with. Unfortunately, these are low, short periods, like hours or days, so we can relatively easily separate them from the signal that we have from the compiler. Okay, to speed up a little bit, here I show all these planets that we already discovered in gray. I hope you can see them. About 16 of them around the stars of different spherical type. Uh, and just to uh, show you a little bit wider perspective, a few of the uh, most important uh, properties of planets around massive or evolved stars. First, first of all, they seem to be more frequent than around dwarfs. Up to 20% of stars seem to show some companion. There are no planets with the 0.6 astronomical unit. It may be either effect of uh, uh, engulfment due to evolution, due to tidal interaction between star and planet, or due to primordial distribution of planets uh, around stars of different mass. There is a star stellar mass planetary mass relation for this uh, evolved stars, and there is no metallicity planet to produce metallicity, metallicity relation. I will not talk into, I will not go into detail about. Uh, all those properties, I want to only to illustrate the problem of orbital separation around stars of different lung G. So we have a plot with uh, orbital separation to no planets in astronomical units, that's what the scale, and then we have log Gs for the parent stars. What we see, for dwarfs, you may have any orbit you like. You may have planet as close as you wish to your star. If you go to more advanced, evolutionary advanced stars, log G decreases. And you have here uh, some areas which are uh, empty. You don't have close in planets to evolved stars. There are several anomalies here, but general pictures like this. It's not absolutely clear whether it's a question of uh, engulfment or initial distribution of, of, of planets in those uh, planetary systems, but that's, I think, quite intriguing. Uh, okay, bright giants with uh, low mass companions. In our survey, we have 12. Stars that we might call the bright giants. Uh, log G is below 2, or uh, luminosity is about 2.5. Luminosity are somewhat uncertain, as I explained already, so log G is above 2. Those are these guys. 12 stars here, 4 with planets. What these planets look like? Very noisy, of course. That's uh, real uh, data for uh, HD 17028 from Jagoskopa PhD thesis. You can see a lot of noise here. Uh, the errors that you see here are not the uh, radial velocity uncertainties, it's uh, the uncertainty plus the jitter that we see. So, lots of noise. If you fit the air orbit, it gives you essentially reasonable results, but you still see what kind of data we have to live with. Okay, what these stars look like and what these planets look like. Uh, I don't know if I have enough time to go into details here, but let me just point out several properties. First of all, of those 12 bright giants, 4 show low mass companions. These are the stars, these are the companions. So you have stars with temperatures slightly above 4000 Kelvin, log Gs with an uncertainty below 2, uh, pretty luminous up to 2.9, uh, very low metallicity uh, and roughly solar masses and of course a lot of jitter that we have to uh, consider. Companions. Long period orbits, 300-600 days or longer, uh, eccentric, around one astronomical unit and masses, total masses, minimum masses in Zion, 4 to 12. So, two of them are in ground works, the plants. So, uh, what's the what's the what's the wider picture? Let's look at all bright giants with planets that are already available in some databases. I collected here a set of 15 of them, mostly from Exoplanet.org, plus Tauke Minor, recently discovered by Mitchell et al., plus two our stars I mentioned already uh, a second ago. What's interesting here? First of all, not the masses of those companions to bright giants. They are all very massive. Of 15, 8 are actually brown dwarfs. We have found a gold mine. We have a place where all the brown dwarfs sit. Uh, that's really an enormous number of brown dwarfs. Another thing that we see here is the orbital separation for those systems. 
which are around one astronomical unit, maybe two astronomical units, and then masses of the stars. The masses, those masses are essentially solar and a little bit higher, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, to up to 2.3. So these are not very massive stars, reasonable masses. You cannot play here a lot to feed down those round worms into planets. But you have a problem because in spite of the high uh, frequency of companions and in spite of high masses of those companions, which are essentially good news for asymmetric planetary nebula, you have a problem here because they, are, they are, are all going to be engulfed pretty soon. So, uh, to go to conclusions, low mass companions to bright giants are quite common from our own survey. I don't know about other surveys because people typically don't publish the list of stars they observe, they don't publish the planets they found. So, from our survey alone, I can say that at least 30% of bright giants do host low mass companions. The round worlds are extremely frequent among those systems. And in the population I prepared for you, 8 out of 15, which is over 50% of companions, are actually massive companions, good enough to produce asymmetric and nebula. But they sit in such orbits that they will all disappear before <laughs> you can actually produce a planetary nebula. So, thank you. That's it. Thank you. I see a question there, Alejandra. So, it seems to me that the fraction of objects in your sample that are not more of the kinds is significantly larger than the dwarfs. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's true. But we don't really uh, know the fraction of planets around dwarfs in our sample because uh, we never got them uh, precisely. This is still a project of our uh, not in your sample, but of course, yeah, the of course. Again, yeah, in words, typically expect about 10% of blocks. So, do you think that this is, is, a, is a result of mass function of binaries? More massive stars are born, have, have a higher chance of being born in non war companions? Because typically, the mass function likes to have a kind of similar effects. Mass is slightly different. Well, I, I don't think it's the case because if you look at the at the, at the masses, that's what you're talking about. If you look at the masses here, the range of masses is not that high. They are all between one and two solar masses, uh, and uh, the brown dwarf frequency is pretty high. So I don't think that you can generate this kind of effect increasing the mass of the star chasing by a factor two. Okay, thank you.